So if, it, if the therapist can think about, you know, that healthy contact, what needs to happen, and think about internal contact and external contact and interruptions to contact, they've got a, a map, if you like, that they could use in the therapeutic process. <laughs> We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 73 of The Therapy Mm. Show, Behind Closed Doors with myself, Jackie Jones, and the formidable Mr. Bob Cook. That's a new word. Are you formidable? (laughs) I'm very... (laughs) At times, I'm. At times, I can be called that. Oh, at times, can't we all? And in this episode, Bob, we're going to be talking about interruptions to contact, an important prerequisite for therapists to understand. Yeah, it's a long title, but I think it's a really important one to look at. And what you basically look at is how clients make contact externally that means with the therapist and and internally that's with themselves yeah so uh if the therapist can think about this in terms of an external process and an internal process they can start thinking about things like um lack of spontaneity by the client an inward process by the client internalization and many of the different defense systems that people put up to stop healthy contact internally and externally yeah that's what i want to talk about that sounds brilliant i've had clients shut down on me where they've definitely shut down and contacts been disengaged or severed completely that's right and the more you the more you get to what the real therapeutic processes are about, then their defense systems, which is to usually uh, move away from external or internal contact, will occur. Yeah. So, like you've just said there, closing down. So, if a client closes down externally to you, uh, that means that in terms they there's an interruption to contact in yeah. their relationship with you, then they will they will signify that and things like moving to into moving to things like intellectualization, uh, dissociation, movements away from the self and the relationship with you, yeah, moving to pastiming, yeah, into humor, moving to places where there's not an authentic sense of contact with you, there might be a completely big shutdown, or there can be, as I say, uh, a move to adaptation. But you'll know, the, the just in the relationship, that the authentic contact has disappeared if it, if it was ever there. Yeah. I think that's important because knowing the person you build up that relationship where you can tell when they've shut down, when they've disengaged, when they've switched topics, oh. whatever it is. Yeah. And this particular client I'm, I'm thinking of, um, that was the time where she always used to go back to a younger self and the confusion came across her face. She oh. just looked really confused and that then shut down. Oh. Yeah, that's a, that's a good example. Of course, when clients come to see you, they may be able to make contact with you from, in TA, we're going to call it an adult ego state. In the yeah. year. But as you start to work with the younger self, like you just talked about here, then healthy contact may disappear. Yeah. And I'm not sure she was aware of it until mm. I pointed it out mm. that she looked confused. Mm. so therapists need always to be thinking about what is happening in the here and now externally between the two of us where you know a sense of spontaneity has disappeared 
a sense of healthy contact perhaps has disappeared. So that's an important prerequisite to start thinking about. Uh. And also another one is to think about whatever is happening at an, in, at an internal level will be manifested externally. Yeah. So, the, so in other words, if there's an interruption to contacts at an external level, then there will be probably uh, an interruption internally as well. So in other words, the narrative to themselves gets disconnected. Yeah. Or there's a different type of narrative taking place. So internal and external contacts tend to go together. So when you say an internal one, could <clears throat> an example of that be like a, a parental interject or, or they've gone into that negative self-talk yeah. Yeah. type of thing? Yeah, yeah. So they've, they've moved away from, say, healthy dialogue yeah. to negative dialogue. And like you've just said, a, an internal sort of parental or interject, if you like. Yeah. Or they're just disconnected and they don't feel anything. They go, well, they might report things like, I just feel numb. Yeah. Or I don't feel I'm really here. Or they won't say anything and appear as blank. And in those situations, you often need to ask what's happening internally to yeah. be able to find out, you know, have a, what's been happening, basically. Yeah. If you wait forever for them to tell you, you'll be, you will be waiting forever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because often they 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 won't know oh. the process. They're not aware that that's what they've done during a conversation. It's okay. yeah. So when you maybe point it out, like I did with this client, where have you gone? Where are you now? She she you know it, she she that was I think when the confusion came because she hadn't realised oh. that she had gone somewhere. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And full contact in a healthy way with the therapist often leads to um, more awarenesses for the client and the chances of aha moments where there's full realisation. Yeah. Because the contact between the client and the therapist is a, you know, a healthy one instead of a, a dysfunctional one where the person's closed down in some ways. Yeah. And it can be really helpful. <clears throat> which them becoming aware of the internal process oh not just oh, the external yeah, one that that's yeah. what they're doing it's it's you know that in itself is awareness and mm. it's really helpful mm. yes you can point it out to the yeah the client that you know i'm mean, what in, in an interesting way i think it's important to say you know i'm aware that perhaps uh you've gone somewhere else because I don't feel in contact with you, say. Yeah. Um, is that is that the case? Yeah. Because again, we need to be mindful of shaming the clients that they you know, they're not present in that moment or whatever. Yeah. Mm. So therapy is, a, is about promoting healthy contact. Yeah. And people do connect and make contact in different ways, which can also be an issue. Do you want to say a bit more about that, Jackie? Because it's interesting. Well, some people do connect intellectually. Oh, I see. And yes. some people connect emotionally and things. So <clears throat> it's about knowing the client well enough to know whether there's been a shift and they've gone from emotional connection to intellectual connection and, and vice versa. Yeah, and <clears throat> one can be... a. Uh, discount of the other yeah so you might be able to connect at an intellectual level but you're disconnected from your feelings yeah and I, th I think that's a good point because the therapist needs to make some sort of analysis about which part of the self they might attempt to connect with yeah or not yeah because it's a nice follow-on from the previous podcast that we did about you know different personalities and things dependent on what situation we're in different parts of ourselves might come up the, the, you know the disconnect uh, protection mechanism 
mm. or you're getting too close to something that I feel uncomfortable about and things like that, you know, so it can be in their awareness. They know externally they are disconnecting because you're going too close to something maybe. It's usually when they feel vulnerable. Yeah. That they will move to a defense process, whether it's denial, disassociation, whatever it is. Yeah. In that process, they'll disconnect to the, usually from the therapist. Yeah. Now, if the therapist can point that out in a way which is not shaming and not critically, um, then it's often useful. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's very useful. Mm. Gosh. Yeah, and often people come to therapy um, because, say, their communication is broken down in relationships, uh, and often they realise they're attempting to connect with their partner on the wrong level. Yes, yeah. So um, they may be trying to connect on an intellectual level, and the feedback they get from their partner is, you don't understand me. Or, you know, you have no sense of trying to understand me in an empathic way. Yeah. So the person, the communication block up is happening because the level of connections are broken. Yeah. For whatever reason. Yeah, because I know you touched on past timing there. <coughs> might move to past timing. Yeah, yeah. That's but right. past timing can be a subject that a lot of people struggle with. <laughs> yeah, because they might want the relationship to be more intimate. For yeah, yeah. And people with social anxiety find it really difficult to just pass the time in conversation. Hmm. Yeah. So it's very important that the therapist thinks about this internal, external connection process we're talking about. And also remember what's happening at an internal level you know, is manifested at an external level. Yeah. So whatever's happening internally will often get projected externally. Yeah. So if they've closed down internally, then they'll close down externally. You can't have one without the other. No. So what do we do? Do we just... Well, so it's interesting. First step, like I said in the uh, title of this podcast, is for the therapist to, I think, start thinking about, you know, just even only, even if it's a simple uh, thought process about what's happening externally will often be happening internally and vice versa. So if, if they've closed down externally, they probably closed down internally. So I think one of the, best ways often for a therapist is just check out if they feel there's a lack of you know external contact just to check out well you know i feel you've gone away somewhere is that true and the person will then usually answer yeah or they may not even be aware they've done it in the first place and then you can say so if they say oh, i wasn't aware i've moved anywhere or anything different's happening and then the therapist can explore that yeah is there a a possibility that the therapist's assumptions or presumptions of how contact is made comes into play so can you say a little bit more it's interesting that well for me you know one of the forms of contact is eye contact looking at the person but i've had clients in the past that eye contact is is quite difficult for them so it's difficult sometimes to make contact external contact with a client that isn't looking at me oh okay that yeah. makes sense yeah it makes absolute sense i'm thinking of a client and this is common what i'm going to say now though i'm particularly thinking of a particular client and when she came in the room for the first session I don't think she ever looked at me. Yeah. In other words, the room has some windows looking out onto the road. And she spent most of the time looking out on the road uh, or looking through the other window at the tree. Yeah. And 
I don't think she really looked at me at all. I can't remember. And then you, the therapist has choices to make. Now, if it's in the first session, do you just, you know, think about that in your head and think, well, I haven't got a, a particularly strong relationship with the client at all. And um, there's obviously good reasons why she's not, yeah, why she's breaking contact with me and think about that in your head and and come back to it later. Yeah. Um, or do you say, well, you know, it's interesting what you're talking about and I realise that you're looking out the window is a reason for that. <clears throat> There's something going on. So I think you have choices about when you ask these queries. Yeah. I think with this person, I did right at the beginning after about three quarters of an hour, probably not even that long, say, oh, well, we haven't really, I've already been looking out the window most of the, the session. Is there, is there something happening for you? And then she said, oh, have I? And then she looked at me. Yeah. And I said, oh, what's it like to look at me for then? This is the first session. Yeah. <clears throat> and she said, well, I do that with everybody because I don't actually trust anyone. So it, le it led us into some interesting information at a, what I would call a script level. Um, and it actually helped our relationship, but, you know, it accelerated the, yeah. um, the, cl the closeness, if you like, even though it was the first session. Because it's really interesting <clears throat> saying that because there's, there's a very fine line in, shaming somebody but allowing them to be seen and heard mm. to me the fact that you noticed that and pointed it out might never have been done with her you mm. know particularly because well this person said i do that all the time mm. so the fact that you took the time to discuss it with them can make the client start to trust and feel like they've been seen and heard with in that hour mm which can be quite powerful. It was very powerful. In the second session, when she came in, <clears throat> she, she sat down and she looked at me and she said, uh, what did she say? Something like, I'm going to attempt to try and look at you as much as I can. Yeah. So we, we, we went back to that first session. I said, well, yeah, I'm not saying you have to look at me all the time, but I'm just interested <laughs> yeah. in what's been going on. Yeah. Then we started to talk a little bit about her lack of trust. And also, I think by the third session, we went to lack of intimacy. Yeah. <clears throat> All from that beginning. Yeah. So contact, however it comes across, is, you know, can be quite useful and insightful in, in the therapy. Whether they have it and then it goes, or whether from session one, the contact isn't, I don't, I don't want to say normal, but if, if there's a disruption in it, you know, from the get-go. Absolutely. And, you know, Jackie, what do you think is happening when somebody uh, feels inadvertently shamed or not? What do you think then the natural defence system of the client would be? To disconnect, uh, yeah. to shut down. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the therapist, if they are aware of thinking about internal and external contact and thinking about healthy contact versus defences, for example, then they've got some important clues, haven't they, to what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Because they might not be aware in the first place what's happening for the client internally. If they're thinking about external internal contact and what's going on generally in that dynamic, they've got, I think, a lot of clues to follow. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's building up that relationship, you know, long term so that it can be spoken about freely without, you know, fear of judgment or, or anything like that. Mm. The more um, 
did you ever lose contact with a client rather than the other way around? I think we're always losing contact with our clients. I don't think it's a matter of do we, don't we? Um, you know, in normal life, if you were having a discourse with anyone, how often would you look at them? So it's like, even though we have, I'm talking about healthy contacting, you know, sorry, healthy relationships uh, is about maintaining contact. I'm not talking about staring at people for 15 minutes. No. I'm talking about filling in contact with them and having yeah. some eye contact. So, yes, you always, you, you'd always, if a therapy is working well, then, and the client is, gets to say feeling more vulnerable places then they're most likely to defend because they don't want the feeling vulnerable yeah so yes i mean i'd be surprised if i went through a therapy well i don't think it could happen going through therapy treatment without a person defending against their exposure of their vulnerable self by disconnecting but as the therapist do you ever disconnect Oh, now you're talking about countertransference. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about negative countertransference, I think, in one of the podcasts not long ago. So if your own stuff is, gets evoked, yeah, consciously or unconsciously, the therapist might well disconnect and start, you know, talking about, well, using intellectualization, pastiming, or going to a different medium where they defend against their own vulnerable self. Yeah. That's very common. Which that's interesting. You know, there's, I want to say there's always two people in the room, but there's probably an awful lot more people in the room when we think about all the different ego states and everything <clears throat> yeah. else that's in there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. it's inevitable. Yeah. It's very inevitable. And I said, again, I think in a previous podcast, not enough is written about negative transference. Yeah. Uh, for the therapist as well as the client. Yeah. And, you know, you've only got to have a client in that you positively identify with in terms of their trauma or whatever they're talking about that may evoke you to feel vulnerable. Yeah. And that might easily lead to some sort of disconnection internally as well as externally. Yeah. Because I think that's one of the things that, the the more I was seeing clients, the more I became aware of that whatever is going on for the client potentially is going on for me as well. You know, we're both human beings, so whatever their process is, I've got my own process as well that can play out in yeah. life and in the therapy room and generally, yeah. So in therapy, of course, that's called transference. Yeah. So if you were trained as a therapist, you would be talking about, there will be a lot of conversations in the training about analysing the transference, which is really analysing what you just talked about. Yeah. Where the two people's processes meet. Yeah. And out of that can come a lot of good. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Because it's, it's not that we <clears throat> can stop it, it's that we're aware of it when it's actually going on. To me, that's the key. Mm. And the best way for that is for you to have done some of your own therapy. Yeah. Then you'll know when you're merging or not merging with the client. Yeah. Mm. As always, it's it's a minefield when we're in the therapy room, whether we're, the, you know, seeing a therapist or whether we are the therapist. We see, I see one of the jobs of a therapist is to help the client manoeuvre their way around the minefield. But to do that, we often need a common map. Yeah. But both of us are sort of in that co-created manner, um, manoeuvring ourselves around the minefield so we don't um, actually step on a mine and get triggered back to the trauma of yesterday, which in a, in a, in a process which isn't useful. Yeah. Because I, th I think one of the, 
the things that's that's useful, you know, at the right time as well in the therapy room is modeling by the therapist. Oh. Oh. You know, because it is a minefield. So what do we do? You know, I I was always fearful when I first started <coughs> being a, a, a therapist that they thought I had all the answers. <laughs> You know, so so sometimes it's okay to be vulnerable in the therapy room and model what being a human being is. I think it's more more than all right. I think it's a vital part of the therapeutic process. Yeah. I think that it's completely, it's really important to understand that because modeling at a correct developmental level is absolutely vital. And of course, a client might never have had that in a positive way. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking of another client who talked about the traumas and abuse from the mother and talk, the client was talking about, well, you know, even though that happened in, in life, I met another, I think, friend of um, the mother's. Or anyway, it was a different, a different, a uh, positive model figure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the therapist needs to model difference, I think, in a positive way. Yeah. I really enjoyed that, Bob. Yeah. And the reason why, oh, good, but just a few bit more. The reason why is that through the modeling, they provide the opportunity for a different type of experience than the original one that the client had. Yeah. Now, that's really, really important because that process creates trans the possibility for transformation, which leads to therapeutic change. Yeah. Well, I mean, in fact, I would say that's one of the most central planks in describing what therapy is about. To help provide the space for a different experience in a positive way. Yeah. Than the old destructive way. And modeling is really important in that process. It's vitally important. And we do it in so many different ways as well. Yeah, and hope we think about it though. You see, the people that come in and say, the therapists come into supervision and say, oh, well, you know, sometimes I think we just had a, th we have a therapeutic chat. I think they're missing from an adult place what they're actually doing. Yeah. Because if they start thinking about what they're doing from a, you know, actual clinical place, then they might see the potency of what helping to provide a different experience means in the world of transformation for the client. Yeah. And it can be done in so many ways in the therapy room as well. Say a little bit more about that. I think that's really important what you just said there. Well, you know, what, what do we model? And like you said, breaking down, is it just a therapeutic chat or are we modeling all the time? But having firm boundaries, you know, is, is a really good way of modeling in the therapy room. You know, showing vulnerabilities, um, making mistakes and being OK with it. You, you, there's, there's 101 different ways that we can model things. You picked on three vital ones there though showing that you're human in the therapeutic room is a really vital one making allowing yourself to make well if you do make mistakes in inverted commas that the world's not going to collapse and we're yeah. all human. um so you picked some really good examples there yeah but like um, you said you know if, if if you break down everything that goes on in the therapy room, there's so much modeling that takes place. Reparenting, you know, being empathic, there's literally. That's right. And you know, Jackie, we're talking all the time about contact. Yeah. When we're talking about these various aspects of therapy, which are so important, we're talking about how the therapist involves themselves 
in a contactful therapy treatment. Yeah. See, I'm not a person that believes. Even I'm, even though I know that people get trained in many different ways, I think the therapist needs to involve themselves in the attempt to make contact with the client, even if they fail. Yes. Because that process will not go unknown or unmentioned by the client. Yeah. And silence is another one. So I think, you know, you know, there's a lot to be talked about. And if you're on a training weekend, you talk about ages about the use of silence and psychotherapy. But one thing I do know that if you take that to its extreme and stay too long in that silent mode, I think it's often experienced in a negative way. Yeah. I'm sure we've discussed this in a podcast quite a while ago. Yeah. I really struggled with silence in a therapy. Yeah, we have because I remember you saying that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to fill the space, whether I was in personal therapy or whether I was actually the therapist because, you know, again, it was something from my past, but I find silence very uncomfortable, or I did. Yeah, so it's a fine line Yeah. between you between helping the client have the opportunity to make realizations and awarenesses yeah. and go to a place where the client feels ignored, um, repeating history, discounted, or all the things I can talk about. It's a fine balance, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it can be seen as a punishment, you know, just silence. It's, yeah. So if we take as a prerequisite, what we're talking here, that one of the main duties of a therapist in the therapeutic process, which will lead to transformation and change, is to provide a different type of experience or opportunity for a different type of experience for the client to actually experience yeah. in the here and now from the negative one back there, if we see that as one of the main, major prerequisites, we are in the world of contact making. Yeah. I now, that, yeah, no, and follow through. And by definition, we are in, I, I, I stop, let's stop. I watched a program the other day about a, a group of scientists explaining um, their desire again to go and um, to Mars and you know what needs to happen when you go to Mars and as it's an alien planet of course what you need to take and the and how environmentally hostile the planet of Mars is now what I'm saying this is is a bit like this in therapy yeah that if you are actually if one of your aims is to provide the opportunity for different experience so they get transformational change the client may experience a completely different alien world yeah just like mars yeah then they'll move out of contact because they'll project and think the therapist is trying to trick them or they they they, they won't believe in the experience or we could go a hundred different ways why they may disconnect. The biggest is, though, I think, is this like an alien experience to them. So they almost don't know what to do with it. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. And you, as you were saying that, that, that it just kept coming back to me that, you know, a lot of the time, that's why, you know, therapy takes place outside of the therapy room as well. You know, looking back on, on a session like that where they feel like they have visited some sort of alien planet and they don't understand the rules or what's going on, often mm. it, it's, it kind of seeps in during the week. Mm. And yeah. it, it's an opening for the, for the following week on what's happening, yeah. Oh. So I'm very much 
think it's a prerequisite for therapists to think about involving themselves in the search for contact making. And that might mean um, thinking about when they interrupt contact. Yeah. That's just as important in the search for transformational change. It, it is so interesting when you, you peel back the layers and you look at all the different things that, that are going on. Oh. And, and like you said, at some point in this intimacy and making contact with another human being is, you know, one, it's one of our relational needs and, you know, two, it's, it's what we want to do. <laughs> That's right. And the big, another big question about talk, talk about contact making, and you hit on it really, is say the therapist has a vulnerability about intimacy themselves. Yeah. Right? So, you know, they may not naturally go out of their way to involve themselves in contact making. Now, they may not think that consciously or even think this through. It might be an unconscious process to do with their script. But I tell you what, the client will pick it up. Yeah. And they'll often then move away. Yeah. And therapy becomes much harder. Yeah. When you have two people disconnected. In fact, it, it, it's almost impossibility in the end. Yeah, because is it, maybe this is my stuff again, because a lot of my stuff comes up while we're doing these podcasts. But, you know, if, if there isn't intimacy, for me, there isn't trust. Oh. And when we're talking intimacy, we're not talking sexual intimacy. We, we're talking about the connection between two yeah. people. Yeah, of course. Uh, but for me, there's, there's something amiss. There's no trust there if there isn't intimacy with somebody. Oh. Yeah. Right. And... Um, we did a podcast years ago well it seems a long time ago now on erotic transference yeah uh, and people are I'm afraid of the vulnerability even if it's in the whole sexual arena they, they, they move away from it the client moves away from it and therapy becomes a different ball game so if, it, if the therapist can think about you know the healthy contact what needs to happen Think about internal contact and external contact and interruptions to contact. They've got a, a map, if you like, that they could use in the therapeutic process. Yeah. What a wonderful podcast, Bob. Mm, thank you. I find, I find it really interesting. Yeah. Thank you mm. so much. Right. So next time we're going to be looking at intuition and important consideration in the therapy process. Oh, God, that's fantastic. I, I, I mean, uh, Eric Byrne wrote a book on intuition in 1957. And, um, I, he, you know, I always think intuition is a bit like magic. So, yes. in fact, the podcast could be used, could be titled How to Use uh, Magic in Psychotherapy. But anyway. <laughs> right, until next time, Bob, don't give too much away. Okay. See you on the next one. See you on the next one. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.